Acts 16. And as you turn there, I want you to think for a moment and think with me about opportunity or, uh, well, I guess it's an opportunity, but a time you had to be sanctified, something that you didn't really plan on. We'll see you in our text in a moment. That's one with both Paul and Silas. Um, but I had this week, and I have another story as per yesterday, but we were heading to Louisville yesterday and got a flat tire on the 65, uh, which was lots of fun. So fix that on the side of the road. Thankfully, everybody was continuing to merge and get over and away from us. But it was flat, like it was flatter than flat. It's like, you know, saggy, wet clothes, flat, right? Just really, really flat. But that wasn't actually my whole point of an opportunity to be sanctified and trust the Lord. Wednesday, I was taking our cats, the great-grandchildren of the Peter's cats or something, however that works out. I don't know. Our daughters, they have a little family tree Channing does too. They have like, this is the mother and this is the cousin. I don't know. Anyway, it's kind of funny. But we have unexpected cats we got earlier last year, and uh, they needed to be fixed to kind of, you know, end this cycle of kittens, right? And uh, finally, finally, after four months of waiting, we're in E-Town. I'm in E-Town with the cats, driving through the intersection, five minutes away. Going to make the appointment time. And I get T-boned in my truck. So that's fun. Uh, thankfully, I don't feel any pain at all, which is really, really good. Um, and it's... What about the cats? The cats were good. Uh, they had already relieved themselves prior to the accident, <laughs> but uh, probably would have had they, had they not done that. Uh, was, I had my windows down for the smell. Um, but everybody's good. They got home safe, and they're in our basement now as we have to give them medicine and all that stuff. So... Yeah, very unexpected. And I was doing it right. And I was obeying the rules of the road. I was not speeding. I came up to the light. It was red. Turned green. The guy next to me was in a semi. He started to go. And of course, I'm in a truck. I'm a little lighter. And I started to go. And I just passed him just enough. He blares the horn. And without a split second, this lady's smashing into me. I don't think she was going maybe 20, 25, though, because there's not a lot of damage. And there were zero skid marks. I was literally her brakes. Um, so I don't, I don't have any word on whether they're going to fix the car, total the car. The guy up in Litchfield that I take to, he said two to three weeks before he gets to look at it. So that will be lots of fun. And that's after calling multiple other places to see whether or not uh, they could fix it. And most people said two to three weeks before they could even look at it. So don't get into an accident if you can help it because they're all backed up apparently. That and eggs and, you know, TP and everything else. Crazy. But I, you know, I did it all right. You know, it's... I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but, you know, doing all the things and you still have a problem. In this case, it wasn't persecution, as we'll see in a moment, but it was an accident. And now I have to have this rigmarole of calling this person, doing this thing, and maybe go to the chiropractor and other thing and rental car. And several of you have already reached out and said, thank you, or not thank you, but, you know, we're happy to help. Let us know, that sort of thing. So to that, I say thank you. But we'll see unexpected things happen. And that happens all the time in our life. And I hope it'll be an encouragement uh, to see that it's nothing new, right? People have been dealing with this for literally thousands of years. So if you wouldn't mind standing, we're going to read Acts 16, and then we'll dig into the text. Acts 16, verse 25 through 40, a little larger chunk than last week. About midnight, Luke writes, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke, he saw the prison doors were open and he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour by night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. 
Then he brought them into the house and set food before them and rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. The jailer reported these words saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said, they have beaten us publicly. Uncondemned men are who are Roman citizens and they have thrown us into prison. And now they throw us out secretly. No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these things to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison, visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Pray with me one more time. Father, thank you again for this text. Thank you that these are real people, a real person being carried along by your Holy Spirit speaking from you. Help us understand what is going on in the text, not just a history lesson, though that is helpful, but also how it applies for us now, how it works for us today, what happened then, and how it works for us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, thank you. We see Paul and Silas In prison, right? They're there, and we're going to get into this and probably kind of focus on some high points. We're not going to examine each verse as it's kind of just more of a standard narrative and pretty straightforward. But it's something that's unexpected, right? We saw last week they were there, and they got beaten with rods. They weren't just, and I got to ride in a police car, by the way, but not because I was doing anything wrong. He took me to the vet with the cats, so that was fun. Uh, The tow truck driver was like, I'll do it, but I got to charge him. And I'm like... Police officer was like, oh, I'll do it for free. I'm like, I like that. So he didn't arrest me, right? He didn't beat me with rods. He didn't say anything. And I actually, you know, I briefly talked to him. Uh, I prayed a couple different times. I meant to pray with the lady. I didn't. Um, I wanted to, but I just, I don't know. I just didn't. Um, But he was like, well, I hope you have a good time. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, just trust in the Lord. God's in control. It'll all work out. He's like, yeah, that's right. Amen. And he got in his car and left. And, you know, He didn't throw me in prison, right? And to that, I rejoice, right? We have such opulence, and it's easy to look at so much of the riches that we have and think, well, I want more. And yet, we see these guys who didn't have that same experience with a police officer that I had as I was in a minor fender bender. And he certainly wasn't beating me or anything else. And even if I was taken to prison, it'd still be like a really cushy, nice prison with, you know, AC and three meals a day and everything else. These guys are in a dank, dark dungeon, basically. So Paul and Silas are there. Why are they there? Well, we saw last week because they healed a demon-possessed girl. Perform an exorcism and <laughs> you get thrown in prison. But not just thrown in prison, beaten with rods, which is repeated. Right? So sometimes we think, ah, oh, persecution, I don't know, ah. Oh. Maybe work, people that don't like me, people online, uh, I don't know. I've never been beaten with rods, and I know you haven't either. Doesn't mean we want to welcome it, doesn't mean we're better or they're better. I'm just saying we need to count our blessings and be thankful. It happens, and it happens throughout the text. This isn't the only time the apostles, Christians, disciples of Christ, get arrested. We see this throughout in Acts 4, Acts 8, Acts 5, 8, and 12. It happens all the time. Right? Even Paul himself is throwing people. Right, He's the one dragging people off the same word and the same words used here. Now he's being drugged. But remember, God promises Ananias, who takes care of Paul there in Damascus, that he will suffer much for my name's sake. Doesn't mean everybody's going to suffer. right? But it means if you do suffer, it's for the sake of Christ. Even if it doesn't seem like it for the moment. Even if it makes no sense. So, we can see Paul and Silas' response to them being beaten, thrown in prison. Before we get too far, though, there's three points in these 15 verses. The first one there, verse 25 through 29, love in the midst of persecution. Love in the midst of persecution. That's the first point that's on the note sheet there, if you have that. The second one, verses 30 through 34, salvation in the midst of persecution, salvation. 
And then lastly, 35 through 40, justice in the midst of persecution. Tertullian, old guy, long time ago, wrote, the legs feel nothing in the stocks when the heart is in heaven. And that's evident with Paul and Silas, isn't it? Because we see here, and look at it with me, 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> did you, did, are they crazy? Like, is there, am I missing something? Like, what happened? What happened between verse 23, 24, and 25? Nothing abnormal. They're in prison after being beaten with rods. And the rods were canes that were most likely wrapped together. And sometimes they would even put an ax between it if they also had to perform capital punishment there. In this case, they obviously didn't. This is Rome. This is Philippi. This is, they've made their way westward and now they're in Europe. And it is really loud on the microphone. Is there any way to turn it down at all? Everybody's, yeah, I'm a little weird at that. Huh? If you can turn it down, excuse me, a little, Keith, that'd be, that'd be nice. Thank you. I feel like I'm being quieter than normal too, so sorry. All right, that's better. Yeah, thank you. So they're now in Philippi. They've gone on the second missionary journey, right? They're now there traveling back around, going through. Paul had picked Silas, and then they pick up Timothy, who's, he writes to the two letters, right? First Timothy, second Timothy, and also Luke, who's the author of both the Gospel of Luke and this book. And we saw in earlier chapter 16, all this kind of catalog, it now changes to the we, 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 right? <laughs> the we, sorry, the we language. I'll make the, all right, three little pigs went all the way home, right? Okay, I've said it before. So I'm a dad, right? It's a dad joke. I don't plan that, I really don't. I really, really don't, I promise. Um, but they're there now. They seem to be, Paul and Silas are separate from Luke and Timothy, because now it's not we again. And we actually see this later on. They don't get back to we until like chapter 20. So it seems like Paul and others go away and they're doing their own thing. And Luke's staying here in Philippi. Because we saw that Lydia, who is a God worshiper, but not quite a Christian, is baptized. And then she has a household. She's wealthy. She's a woman of means. She doesn't have a husband. She's got a house at least here and in Thyatira where she's from. And so there's this rich and wealth and these things. And she's using her wealth, something we can all do. For the kingdom. She's using it to say, hey, come meet it. This is like a focal point, right? Basically first, you know, first Baptist Philippi. And it's right at her house. And so Paul here in this, he's loving even in this point. Verse 25 through 29. But really the high point is verse 25. He's showing love and singing and praying hymns to God. Praying and singing hymns. And the prisoners were listening. It's loud enough for them to hear. And not just them, but likely the jailer too, right? Because he asks and says, what must I do to be saved? The question that we all want to hear from our unbelieving friends and neighbors and children. The T-ball answer, right? The five and you got the in the wiffle ball and, spray, and just the gospel. That's what we all want. That's what we all hope for. But notice the message is always the same. This isn't different than other parts of the scripture, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New, and it's still the same today. If you don't know Christ, be saved by believing in him. And believing means you adhere to what he has done, who he is, what he has done in his life, his death, his resurrection, taking upon the sins that are yours and him giving you his righteousness. It's this both and. Some Pastors and preachers will focus on, well, you're such a sinner, you're such a sinner, you're terrible, terrible, terrible. Be be forgiven, okay? And then others will focus on new life, freedom, freedom, liberty in Christ. But they don't focus on the sin. The gospel and the law, the law teaches us that we're, we're sinners. All have sinned, all have fallen short of God's glory. Everybody's lied, cheated, stolen, committed adultery, lusted, been angry. Jesus compares our actions even to the action, right? Of the actual, you're angry, you've committed murder in your heart, you're, you've lusted, you've committed adultery, so on. But this isn't to condemn us only and then leave us wasted, rather to cling to Christ. And that's the whole point. And that's what you do when you believe. It's nothing else, right? God perfects us through these trials when we come to him. And sometimes and oftentimes uses this to push us to himself. 
So Paul shows this love, right? He doesn't say other things, right? He doesn't say love, you know, you know believe and do good works, right? And then you'll be saved. Believe and give a lot of money to the synagogue. Believe and go on a mission trip. Believe and wear this you know, special thing or do this special thing or pay, pay, do this, go here, face this thing. What does he say? 31, he says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And it's fascinating because Paul and Silas, if you're going to look at it from an outside perspective, they're the ones that need to be saved, right? And they were technically just delivered from prison. But these guys are condemned. They're beat up. They're bloody, no doubt, that because we see in a moment that their scars and or, or lacerations and bruises, they, they were just literally beaten to a pulp and thrown in prison. It's not like the EMTs there, like, checking them, you know. No. They're the ones who need to be delivered. That's what salvation means, is deliverance. Brought from here to here, right? And yet, he's the one, the jailer, some likely hardened Roman guy on his last stint, a Roman soldier, no doubt, still has some sort of dignity left. You know, this is my prison, right? But we see, and he's going to stab himself, kill himself. The word sword really is like dagger. This is what happened when you lost your prisoners. It was your life. This is why the whole resurrection and Jesus being stolen, his body, is a total nonsensical lie. Because Rome would never let that happen. The Roman soldiers, if the disciples supposedly would come and steal his life, as steal Jesus' body, as some say. It would be their life. That would, that's it. They're not just going to let it go and be like, ah, it happens. <laughs> this is no big deal. No, it's a huge deal. And this guy supposes, because the prison doors are open, obviously these guys escaped. Why? Because they're human. And yet somehow they didn't. I don't know why. There's not some secret knowledge that I have doesn't say. So God kept them there. Maybe they were just mystified. Maybe they came to faith too and doesn't say. I don't know. But no one left. That in and of itself was a miracle, right? Especially Paul and Silas. They didn't do anything wrong. They're following God. But so often we think, I'm following God and everything wrong happens to me all the time. Why? Well, it's a broken world, number one. Your own sin, number two, and or just the categorical sin of the creation. But that's why Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to not just save us now for heaven and oh, well, whatever. No, he's redeeming us, refining us, changing us, shaping us. Jails are significantly better today than they were then, right? That's one little, you know, minor thing. Jesus changes lives, and then that changes households, which changes communities, which changes the world. And history shows that. It's a little rocky right now, I understand that. But you have to zoom out and look at the overall scope. There's more Christians, more universities, more churches, more denominations. Well, maybe not a better thing, but you know. Uh, more books, more evangelism, more freedom, which all comes from the Lord. Freedom of conscience ultimately comes from God himself. Because he calls us to himself. He doesn't force us. So Paul loves in the midst of this. He loves it. He could let the guy kill himself, right? But he doesn't. He loves by telling these prisoners. He could be, you know, they could just be there sitting. <sighs> Great. Can't believe this. Can you believe this, Silas? This is ridiculous. We're doing the right thing. What is God doing? They're praying. And singing. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Why? Because these guys, these other prisoners, are no doubt looking at these guys like, what are they? Do they know where they are? Do they know what's going on? Are these guys insane? Like, ah, uh, do you get it? I don't get it. Like, let's just sit here in awe and be like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and no doubt the jailer is the same way. Though he was asleep, but he was likely hearing them beforehand. It's midnight, they can't sleep, likely. Doesn't say why, but, you know, we can imagine. But Paul loves this man, loves these prisoners in the midst of his trial. Why? Because his focus is on God. His focus is on Jesus as king, not his circumstance. 
which I implore to you, and one thing that we can pull out of this for us today. We can't look at our circumstance. And I hate talking about myself positively because it sounds like you're bragging. But both times I prayed with Wednesday and yesterday. And the Lord delivered. That's not a promise that everything will always go the exact same way. But in fact, I didn't mention this. Yesterday, a guy showed up. I didn't even see him stop. It's weird. I like, he's like, hey. And I'm like, because he pulled up in front of us. My back is because I'm facing, you know, oncoming traffic, making sure, you know, some crazy person doesn't come hit me. Everybody's standing off in the, what was it, kind of like muddy grass. Of course, there's trash on the side of the road, right? Anyway, and I'm like kneeling down and he says, hey, behind me. And I turn, I'm like, well, hey, <laughs> well, he was a guy, a side, a side of the road, you know, triple A type guy. And he's like, I can help you. But he like didn't want to do it because like that's his job. But he told me everything to do. So they, I ah, grab that case. All right, grab this, pull that. Basically he had a drill and because I'm having a hard time, you know, doing the manual jack, the little thing that comes with the van. Took way less time. It was Bennett's birthday yesterday, by the way, so that was shaved off some some time. But he helped me. I didn't call him. I looked over to Jen. He's like, "You called somebody?" She's like, "No." <laughs> well, the Lord called him, right? Did I need him? No, I probably would have gotten it done, but maybe I wouldn't have. Maybe we would have been there longer. Maybe some semi would have come and killed us all. I don't know. I don't know, right? This is all hypothetical. But the point is, you. Trust God in those times and I say, I can't believe this. Why me? This is so terrible. And that's something that we're all struggling with, right? Whether it's shock or anger or resentment. Why me? I'm not saying I'm perfect. Don't hear that. Not at all. <laughs> I've certainly responded in anger and why me many times. But the point is, what is your response? When God has something, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, when something is unexpected, literally, hey, here's this thing. And you're like, uh, what do we do? What do you do? Is it love? Is it love towards God, love towards others? Me checking that lady, making sure she was okay too. A few other people stopped, thankfully. One was a off-duty firefighter from uh, Glendale. Or is it our count it all joy, like James says? Or God gives, God takes away, like Job says. Or, well, it could be worse. Thankfully, it's not, etc. And no doubt, it's likely a mixture, right? But the whole point is, in this life, we're not dead yet. God still has stuff for us to do. And he refines us, sharpens us, strengthens us, giving us opportunity to participate in redemption. Showing love towards others, showing love towards our family, towards our community, and towards God himself. So Paul and Silas do that here. And it leads to what? Salvation. But before we get to the second point, a couple things we can pull from this further. Number one, a good way to show this love simply is just by asking someone you know or don't know, totally random. And you can say it's random. I do this all the time. I'm like, this is totally random. but And then it just kind of gives you carte blanche to say anything. It's wonderful. You say, hey, can I pray for you? Your restaurant, friend, somebody online. How can I pray for you? I just did this on the phone with the insurance lady a couple days ago. She was taken aback. She's like, well, yeah. You know, and she shared a few different things. And it was great. Right? And it's just one way to just kind of open up the door to allow people to be like, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's not weird. Paul and Silas are in prison being beaten or had been beaten. And they're professing Christ. Singing and praying. Number two, you can read your Bible in public, quietly or out loud, coffee shop, work, wherever. Number three, praying to the Lord to see the needs around you. A lot of times we kind of get caught up in the moment, right? Our day to day, Tuesday, Wednesday, okay, Friday, oh, this thing. Oh, we've got this other stuff going on. It's a birthday. It's got this. We've got this. And you miss so much, right? Pray that the Lord will show you those around you, how you can have love and show love towards those, even in your closest circles. Lastly, don't let your problems define your theology on who God is. This is a big one. 
Because often people will say, well, because of God, this. Well, because this happened, I don't believe in God anymore. Well, that's not how that works. <laughs> right? Because God doesn't change. Your circumstances changed. Yes, it's a new year. Right? But God is still king. He's still ruling and reigning. Remember, he's the beginning, as the Greek in, 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 in A to Z, Alpha Omega, right? The first and the last, which means everything is out in front of him all at once. He's no different than he was 1,000 or 3,000 or whatever thousand, six to 10,000 years ago when he made Adam and Eve. He's not. He's the same. Multiple, multiple passages speak of God being eternal in that way. But so often we get so sucked into our own circumstances. Why? Well, we forget simply reading, right? Praying, fellowshipping, evangelism, reading good books. God can take our frustration, right? He says, give my bur- your burdens to me, right? He says, come to me. He is our shepherd, as I just read with our call to worship. Now, shepherds, obviously, they're not all obedient little sheep, right? They have the rod and the staff. Those aren't just fancy little like, oh, these are my decorations. Like, these are things to poke and prod and get these sheep back in line. God uses that all the time for you all, if you're a Christian. And if you're not a believer, he'll probably still use it, but too often people will just brush it aside. They'll ignore it. Whether it's reading of the scripture or hearing a sermon or some random act like an earthquake. And people will continue to push it and they'll harden their hearts. But repeatedly, the scripture says, don't harden your hearts, right? And it's easy for us, even as Christians, followers of Christ, to even harden our own hearts, right? And miss the love, miss the opportunity. Ah, that's not bad. Ah, I don't have enough time. Open up. Let God work. Number two, salvation in the midst of persecution. So we see what this leads to. Salvation leads from this man, Paul and Silas, being loving toward him, toward the other guys. Because again, they could have just sat there and just been like, "Ah, this is dumb. What is God doing? I can't believe this. Grumbling and complaining, right? Earthquake, no earthquake. Maybe they had an earthquake and he leaves. They all leave. Well, the, the Philippian jailer would have killed himself. No salvation for him. No salvation for his Household. Verse 30 says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's again that T-ball answer. And this, this saved, remember, always context defines a word, right? It's, all, it's not just like, oh, this word has a definition. Yes, that's a good starting point. But like green or gray or anything else, there are a million words that go into any particular thing, depending on how you use them. Well, Saved is one, too. I mean, we use it all the time still. Oh, I saved a bunch of money. Right? I saved a seat for you. Are you saved? Those are three different ways that we use saved. Some have similar meaning to others. But this saved here in the context, what does he do? He falls down. This guy who's part of Rome. Rome is the dominating, they're, they're colonized Philippi, right? They rule. They're there. And he falls down before Paul and Silas. These condemned men. He doesn't know they're Roman citizens. He just thinks these are vagabond Jewish guys causing a problem. Talking about some Nazarene guy who raised from the dead. Great, whatever. Looney Tunes, you guys are nuts. And he falls down before them. So clearly he's not talking about salvation for his circumstance, right? Because he was already even delivered from the earthquake. He didn't have any harm. This is salvation from what everyone ultimately wants. Salvation from this broken, nasty, cursed, sinful world. Everybody has that need. Most people ignore the need until they're dead and it's too late. Most people try and, other people, if they're not just going to ignore it, they create a system of, you know, keeping this and doing good works. And if I do this, and then God will like me at the end of life. No, that's not how the salvation works. That's not the gospel. The gospel is perfection through Christ and simply believing in him. And when you believe, you surrender, you then surrender your life to him, albeit very imperfectly. But we do this through faith in him. This is throughout the whole text of scripture, all 66 books, it's not new. 
This isn't some particular thing that was invented in the first century. As we see, and I say so often, Abraham believed God before there was any, any Bible. Abraham, right? Father of Isaac and Jacob. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Meaning, he's saved, he's delivered from this present world because the world is passing away. We see this, the world is groaning, the world has problems. We all see it, war, disease, famine, pestilence, anger, strife, divorce, abuse. It's everywhere. It's not because God doesn't exist, it's because he does exist. We have that reason to say, this isn't right. When you go back to the foundation and there's something wrong down the line when you're building a building, for example, you go back to square one and you say, well, it should be like this. If you feel like it should be like something, that means there's a standard. Well, what's the standard? The creator, God himself. And so this salvation comes through the midst of love that Paul and Silas show this man. And they simply say what is said throughout. Believe and you'll be saved. You'll be saved. Despite the hysteria, the excitement, the craziness, he falls down. And he asks them the question we all want to hear. 32 says, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. So this isn't an automatically like you get saved and like your kids get saved. Remember, household isn't just like kids. It's servants. It's maybe your brother, maybe your, your older parents, stuff like that. Because Lydia doesn't have a husband, presumably doesn't have children, um, especially since she never been married, if she'd never been married. But she still had a household. So there's people, right? There's lots of industry. They can't just go to you know, Dollar General and buy stuff or go up to Walmart or whatever. You gotta make stuff, right? <laughs> so there's lots to do. So households are more than just immediate family. But 33, he says he look, he took them that very hour at night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once. So both the guy, he needs, they need saving, right? Out of their circumstance, which they, they are, and then yet he also needs saving, right? And then he washes them because they hadn't been washed. Right? They've been, I mean, just get, take a baseball bat to your back one time. And this is like beaten, like multiple times. The police are there, you know, with clubs. How many times? I don't know, but more than once is enough for me. <laughs> and he then cares for them. And then likewise, there's all this parallelism in this like opposite, but like walking together. He's then baptized, right? So he's washing them and then he's being baptized, he and his family. And like such a wonderful, just kind of like harmony of what's happening. He sees their cuts, their bruises, and he cares for them. Similarly to what Lydia does. She says, yeah, come, come, you're eating. Let's go. Come on, come to my house. And they're like, ah. You know, and the language is she prevailed upon us. Like she kept asking. Hospitality is huge. If you're unwilling to have people in your house or be hospitable, you know, that's one thing that's easy to do for everybody. But don't be unwilling. Don't think, ah, it's not clean. It's not this. That's okay. Nobody has a perfectly clean house all the time. Show the love of Christ that has been shown to you. 34, then he brought them up to the house and set food before them. These guys are prisoners, right? They're not released yet. They're prisoners. And he's like, hey, oh, food, food, right? Same thing with what Lydia did. That's a mark that this man really knows Christ. That he comes to saving faith. Now, does he have everything ironed out? Is he all like refined and like a really strong, solid Christian? No. <laughs> but like, so what? That's what salvation is. is. You come to Christ and then he deals with you after that. That's sanctification, right? Some people get really confused. They're like, well, I'm just not really a good person. I know. Neither am I. Welcome to the club, right? Like, I'm still sinning. I know. Welcome to the club. Me too. Like, but Jesus is continually dealing with us. Remember, we're not dead yet. There's stuff to do. He brought them into the house, set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his whole family that he believed in God. Other translations say that they had believed together. I think that's actually really the case. I'm not sure why ESV, what I have here, translates it that he specifically, but either way, they're all coming to Christ. They've all seen their need for Christ and they've all bowed the knee. 
He doesn't talk about mission trips. He doesn't talk about, you know, giving money to the poor and, you know, doing this and, and all these other things. Just come to Christ. And if you don't know Christ, church, come to Christ. It's not too late. It's not. This guy is the enemy, quintessential enemy, holding uh, condemned men that should not be condemned. They did all this stuff illegally. This was not the Roman rule that they should have done anyway. The riot breaks out and, you know, mob violence. Even then they had standards. But this guy's holding these guys and he knows their need. He knows they have something I don't have. And that's the, that's the key here. That's one of the main points. Paul and Silas have something and they show it by praying, by reading, or uh, praying and, and singing and just living unto Christ. No doubt they're obviously preaching and being vocal, but they're not being annoying. You don't have to be annoying to upset the devil, right? You just have to do what God wants. Lastly, this guy who washes others is himself also washed. There's justice. Verse 35 through 40. There's justice in the midst of persecution. So love, salvation, justice. These big words, right? These are all words that we all hear often in our culture, from our phones, from the news, from school, from wherever. Oh, it's just love. It's all about love, right? Salvation, all you need to save. No, maybe less so in some circles, but certainly justice, right? And we always put something in front of it. Climate justice, social justice, you know, gender justice, whatever justice, racial justice. Well, justice is just justice like other words. It's just itself, it's its own thing. It doesn't need to put something in front of it or it changes the meaning, which is probably why they do it. But God's justice is true justice. God is always on the side of actual true justice, not a pet peeve, you know, little project justice that is currently popular in our culture. But I want us to think for a moment before we get too far. Do you rejoice at God? salvation do you rejoice at the salvation that god gives that he gives through jesus that he gives through particular situations i was delivered twice this week you could make it small you could say that's happenstance either way i believe wholeheartedly that god preserved me both wednesday and yesterday yes it's annoying yes it's frustrating yeah we have you know 50 percent instead of two cars we have half a car right can't go more than 50 miles an hour, and now we got to do this, and Jenny's got stuff tomorrow, and we got to borrow something else, and maybe get a rental, and we got to go to the, fix the tire. Like, there's all this extra stuff. But, like, taking it one day at a time, right, as we often hear, but that's exactly what we do, right? Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Well, each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen? Amen. Right? I mean, I could fret about it, and that's something that's so easy to do, and so often... Kind of this like accepted sin in the church. <sighs> no, don't worry. Fear not, little flock, Jesus says. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. But in everything with... <sighs> I lost the verse. Prayer and supplication, right? Yeah. Went right out of my head. Prayer and supplication. Make your requests be made known to God. Why? Go to God. Don't just worry and be like, oh, just, it'll be Okay. Will it, though? If God isn't king, it won't be okay, right? But he is king, and that's what we constantly need to be reminding ourselves of. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So justice comes, and the magistrates, the police, right? They do this big public beating, throw these guys in prison. Uh, yeah. Magistrates, most likely, there were two guys that were kind of ruling, kind of like, you know, mob boss mayors, and then the police are their minion guys. That the language there is um, kind of like Billy Club guys, right? They didn't have guns, of course, but they had clubs. And the jailer reports this, right, and says, "Hey, the magistrate said you can go, come out and go in peace. It's good news, right?" This guy's just like, "Hey, everything's good. We're good. I got, I got creator and 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 this 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 carpenter guy who rose from the dead. He's my lord and." This is just amazing, and, and I'm just a different person now. By the way, you guys are not, you guys can go, it's cool, like everything's good. And Paul's like, no, no, we're not going to do that.
What does he say? He says, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And now they throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Verse 37. Paul's using his God-given ability or station as a Roman citizen. And there's kind of this impasse in our culture of like hating who you are. You know, whether it's your gender, whether it's your heritage, whether it's even being American, many people do that. Maybe not so much in our circles, but it happens all over the place. And we think, well, and a lot of Christians will get sucked into this too, to a degree. We might not say, you can't hate your gender, that's how God made you, but we're going to hate, you know, being a man in the sense of like responsibility or women in the sense of submission or as American, like, well, they're just really bad people. But God made you American. Just like you made Canadians, Canadians, Mexicans, Mexicans, Brazilians, Brazilians, Koreans, Koreans, and so on. He did it. But we like kind of like bifurcate and think like, well, maybe not this. And then we're like ashamed of it. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that we need to be, oh, we're Americans above being a Christian. No, we're Christians who are Americans, right? And I would say the same thing if I was in Italy, speaking Italian to Italians. You're Italian. You're not born in America. I'm not born in Italy. So let's rejoice in how God works things out, blesses stuff based on response to him and the proclaiming of the gospel, how it changes communities, changes his lives. These things matter. And sometimes we just don't really think too deeply about them. But Paul uses this and says, hey, no, I'm Rome. I'm a Roman citizen. That's not right. And he's also likely protecting those later on who are already come to Christ, who are Philippian Roman people who won't be hassled now, hopefully, by the authorities who are saying, hey, you need to shut up about, you know, this Jesus character. Why? Because they have rights. And we have rights as Americans, like it or not. And if they take them all away, God is still king. Amen? Amen. But we have rights. So do we need to be like, oh, I mean, pretend like we don't have rights? Like, I'd rather live here than North Korea. I don't know about you, but I'd rather live here than there. I'm thankful I live here. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm snobbish and better and I'm worshiping this. If that's what you're doing, that's an idol. That's sin. Don't do that. But be thankful to God who has placed us here in this proper time. So he gets saved. Salvation comes in all different ways. Mainly through Christ, not salvation, excuse me, I'll rephrase that. Salvation from sin and death and glory is through Jesus alone. But there's other salvations, right? Deliverance from a car accident or from prison or from a bad situation. Abuse. Bad job. You name it. Bad relationship, whatever. So love, salvation, justice. Deuteronomy 32, 35. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near. Their doom rushes upon them. The Lord will vindicate his people and relent concerning his servants when he sees their strength gone and no one is left slave or free. The author of Hebrews quoting that, Hebrews 10, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And that's something that's so, it's hard not to. It's hard not to take vengeance. It's hard not to say, and Paul does use his rights here, but he could go further and he didn't. He could have required these men to not only lose their position, but possibly their life because they broke Roman law. But he doesn't do that. Right? So he pushes a little bit to protect his friends likely, and also probably out of own self-preservation because, hey, you did something wrong. This is the law. Then obey the law, guys, just like we can do today. Now, we don't need to be jerks about it, but we also don't need to cower. We have a First Amendment. We're not worshiping it, but we have it. So we're going to say, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even though that's illegal in many parts of the world. Well, you should still say it, even if there isn't a First Amendment. But we have one, so let's be thankful for that. So Paul doesn't push further. But he does say, hey, this is wrong. You guys need to apologize. So 38, he says, Luke, the police reported these words to the magistrates. They were afraid, heard they were Roman citizens. They came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. Notice the difference. Didn't drag them out. Didn't beat them. Paul's already been stoned before as well. 
lots and lots of persecution. But this justice is seen for both now and later on for his brothers and sisters who were at Philippi. Lastly, verse 40, then it says, they went out of the prison, visited Lydia. Notice they're kind of hanging around a little bit. Just like, just want to let you know, we're still here. We're not just leaving super early. We're not scared of you. We'll go. We'll go. But we're going to say, we're going to say bye to a few friends first, the church we planted. They visit Lydia, which implies her household as well. And when they'd seen the brothers, right, the brethren, some verses straight, both brothers and sisters in Christ, they encouraged them and departed. No doubt a great story, right? Like, you know, the stories are always wonderful. It's always nice to tell the story after the fact is, you know, with me and my car and, and the van yesterday. I'd be rather, much rather here than, you know, in a hospital bed or something. Of course, better to tell the story of craziness and like you've gotten out of it, right? <laughs> but nobody really wants to welcome that story to be told yet, to experience it first. But so often we, we miss, right? And if you could pull one thing, the whole thing, just kind of the mass of this whole chapter, is God is ruler over now the Roman gods. Because they're now breaking into Roman territory. 100% Roman, not this like mixture of like Roman and kind of Yahweh there in Judea. They are over the Roman gods. Jesus is over the Roman gods. Juno, Jupiter, all of them. One thing, and this is the fill-in, if you're still tracking with us, Verse 39, related to this, and this is something we can really do today, even now, a good rule to follow is the level of repentance must equal the level of sin. So repentance must equal the level of sin. So if you've sinned against God, go to God. You don't need to tell everybody, hey, I had this this thought, and it's like, okay, it's a little much. But you've sinned against your wife, your husband, your children, publicly you do that, then you go back to them and do that in front of your children your wife, your husband, your friend. It's in front of the church, right? Some kerfuffle, something at community group, something at ladies Bible study, men's group, whatever. Hey, I'm really pissed at you. I can't believe this. And you have some words with somebody who's there. You better believe. If you don't, I'm going to ask you. Because the level of it, otherwise you're trying to hide it. You're trying to you're just hide it. Let's put, you know, put it away. Let's put it under here. Like, that nah, didn't happen. I, I, I apologize, to, apologize to the Lord. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. But if you sin against other people too, go to them. Why? Because we're all sinners. Like we're all in the same boat. Like quit the act. If you're trying to act, I don't think most of you are. Really, I don't think you are, which is great. But many people in the church are probably like, oh, I don't really have any problems. Yes, you do. Stop lying. Like, I know you're like trying to be like pious or something, but like it doesn't, the false humility is no good either. So if you sin against someone, go to them. I've had several in the time I've been here, hey, I just want to let you know, I said this thing, I don't ask for forgiveness. And I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't even notice, but thank you so much. Far better to apologize for something that the Spirit has pricked your heart on than be like, nah, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. It's fine, it's fine. She didn't think it was a big deal. It's fine. He didn't say anything. Nah, I don't care. It's oh, well, my pastor will think I'm so weird. I'm a loser. I'm, uh, he'll think I'm a sinner. It's like, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> and then he'll be reminded of some sin that he did too. So Jesus is Lord over these Roman gods and he will build his church and he's continuing to build his church. This justice here, Paul doesn't say I'm a citizen of heaven. It's okay. He still uses his Roman citizenship, but he doesn't press it all the way. It's something we can do too. The interest in the kingdom is simply belief in Christ. That's how you get in. That's it. Like, that's the good news. Belief isn't, well, I believe in God, but then, well, okay, if you do, then where's that fruit? We see that after the fact. Right? There's peaks and valleys. I understand that. But if you are continuing to shut up and push down and ignore the commands of Christians, well, then you're probably not really a Christian. Or you're certainly living in some sort of sin. But because Jesus is king over the Roman gods, and not just the Roman gods, but our beloved American gods, and to which are many, 
We can look to him in our circumstance and love in the midst of that and, and, and proclaim salvation in the midst of that and know justice comes in the midst of that, even if it doesn't feel like it. And this isn't pie in the sky. Like Again, it's something like, well, I just don't feel like it. The Bible doesn't talk about feelings very much, really at all, including love itself, right? I just don't feel like loving him. I don't feel like doing that. I don't care. I'll tell my children all the time. I don't care if you feel like doing it. I still ask you to do it. <laughs> I don't feel like it. I don't, it doesn't matter. Do it anyway. Right? But he knows our frame, and it's so much better to go to him because you're not going to me, right? You're not asking me. You're going to Christ alone. He is our mediator. I'm not your priest. I'm not going to absolve your sins. You go to the great high priest alone because I have, a, I have all my own problems and my own sin. Paul tells them the gospel. First Lydia, then casts out the demon lady, demon girl, and then the jailer. Luke showing this whole thing. The gospel is for everybody. Women and men, boys and girls. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, 